Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to talk about Deuteronomy chapter 32. It's a long chapter and it's a unique chapter. It records, well, we'll get into that in a second. Let's talk about when the words in Deuteronomy chapter 32 were initially spoken. About 1500 years before Jesus, 1450 BC, right at the end of Moses' life. And that brings us to our main character section. First of all, we've got Moses, who in the last chapter we learned is 120 years old. He's just about to die, and we'll talk about that more at the end of this chapter. And then we've got Joshua. Joshua is going to take over for Moses. Joshua had been Moses' longtime assistant in the wilderness, and God had appointed him to be the next leader of the Israelites. They're our final main character. The Israelites were a, a nation of people. They were the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So where exactly are we in terms of our map? The Israelites had been promised a homeland near, well, in Canaan and the surrounding areas. God had promised that to Abraham like hundreds of years ago. And so the Israelites have traveled from Egypt through the wilderness to the west side, or sorry, the east side of the Jordan River. They're camped at a place called Moab, and it's not gonna be long before they cross the Jordan River and go into Canaan and finally get to live in that promised land. In our outline, we've got 52 verses to cover in this chapter, and the majority of them are under this first section, God's Song for the Israelites. This is verses 1 through 47. So Deuteronomy chapter 13, the majority of it, contains the words of a song that God gave to Moses to teach to the Israelites. We read about that back in chapter 31, verse 22. The song was to be passed down through the generations of the Israelites, and it was to act as a, quote, witness if the Israelites broke their covenant with God. This is a chapter that you're definitely going to want to read for yourself. There's a lot of figurative language. Obviously, it's authored by God, so it's quite, quite an incredible song. Uh, and so don't rely on this summary to give you the full effect of what's going on here. But let's, let's try our best to give a little bit of a summary. The song begins by praising God for his faithfulness and for his justice. And it describes how God nurtured the forefathers of the Israelites and then the nation of Israel. And they developed into a, a large and prosperous nation. The, the metaphor that's used is as an eagle who cares for her young after they're born. But though God had cared for them, the song goes on to describe how Israel forgot about God and, and disobeyed him and broke covenant with him. Instead of giving their love and worship to the true God who had helped them, they gave their worship to false gods who had never done anything for them. And this enraged God, and the text says that God was jealous for the affection of his people, and his anger burned to the depths of Sheol. He promised, God promised, to send curses on the people, just like he had talked about in the last couple chapters, plagues, arrows, disasters, poisonous pestilence, hunger, wild animals, violence by the sword, and, and other things. Several verses are then devoted to God rebuking the Israelites for their short-sightedness in, in not considering the long-term outcome of, of where their decisions were going to lead them. But the song also mentions the compassion of God and the fact that for those who chose to love him, he would care for them, he would vindicate them in the end. And the end of the song is a powerful reminder about the power of God and his supremacy over, over everything and everyone who opposes him. I want to read you verse 43. Quote, Rejoice with him, O heavens, bow down to him, all gods, for he avenges the blood of his children and takes vengeance on his adversaries. He repays those who hate him and cleanses his people's land. So Moses and Joshua were then tasked to teaching this song to the people, and that's exactly what they did. They told them that they needed to take the words in this song to heart. So that is section number one. In our final section, we're going to talk about the death, the imminent death of Moses. It's not going to happen yet. Don't worry. Don't cry yet. I will be sad when Moses finally has to be taken off the character list because he's been with us for like months in our study now. But verses... 48 through 52 talk about the imminent death of Moses. So God told Moses to go up to Mount Nebo, which um, verse, uh, chapter 34, verse 1 tells us that Moses went to Nebo to the top of Pisgah. And we've been talking, talking about Pisgah, and it's been on our map for quite a while, so that will tell you the location. So he was to go up to this Mount Nebo to the top of Pisgah because it was, it was time for him to die. Moses was allowed to look over the land of Canaan from the top of the mountain, but he was not allowed to go into the land of Canaan because of a mistake that he had made back in the wilderness, which you can read about in Numbers chapter 20. 
And now for our application. I'd say today is more of an interpretation section than an application section, but it's important. I'll explain why in a second. What does it mean when the Bible says that God is jealous? Right? Isn't jealousy a bad thing? That's typically the way that it's framed. This is an important question because the jealousy of God comes up several times in the scripture. So it's important to understand the idea. Jealousy, yes, it certainly can be a bad thing, but it's not always a bad thing. If you're married, then you should be jealous for your spouse, right? You don't want to share your spouse with somebody else. Your spouse belongs to you and only to you. I think the jealousy in this chapter may be best understood in the parent-child relationship. So a parent who pours love over a child and raises that child from birth to maturity has the right to expect love and respect and appreciation from that child. If the child just grows up and dismisses their parents, act like their parents have never done anything for them, and they give all of their affection to somebody else, somebody who didn't contribute in any way to their upbringing, never cared for them, never contributed any love to their upbringing at all, and they just give all of their affection to that individual, well, I think the parent then in that situation has a right to be upset. And this is what is being described in this chapter. God raised Israel like the eagle and her young. He brought that nation up. And yet when they grew up, they just gave all their love and affection to false gods who had never done anything for them. So does God have a right to be jealous over them because of what he's done for them? The answer is yeah. So that hopefully will uh, help clarify this idea of the jealousy of God. There are probably better illustrations out there, but those are the ones I have for you today.